As I said, I signed up for hosting tonight because I know the featured reader a little and I know the poetic opener a little, but I realize now it's actually harder to introduce somebody who you know well. So I just stick with what is written down here because I would have many anecdotes to tell about this person, <laughs> but uh, I, I'd rather not. <laughs> and instead say about our poetic open, now, Sandy O'Reilly has been involved in the PEP community for the past few years as a member of the Planet of Poetry B, and she recites her poetry as often as possible on Friday evenings. I want to add that she usually does that knowing them by heart. I saw that she brought something written down today. We'll see how it goes. Um, she has been published in the pandemic anthology, The Sky is Falling, The Sky is Falling, like many others who are here. And I just checked, there are still eight copies of that book left down here at Russell's. If there are still eight left after the show, you haven't done good yet. So <laughs> get some of those. But in any case, please welcome Sandy O'Reilly. Only here on the show. Well, I'm glad to be reading here tonight with the famous Daniel Scott. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's lots of you to hear that too. Um, I grew up in a place called Sarnia, Ontario. It was called Chemical Valley, kind of politically incorrect today, because it was the terminus for pipelines from Alberta, really politically incorrect. But there was Imperial Oil and Esso and Shell and Dow Chemical and Polymer, the first synthetic rubber plant created during the second war when they couldn't get rubber from Malaysia. And, he, and uh, Cabot Carbon Black, where my dad worked, where they burned gas at really high temperatures and made these little carbon pellets that had lots of industrial uses. And in fact, if they didn't use them, you'd have to be buying new tires for your car every six weeks. So it was a pretty um, busy time. I mean, people had jobs and there was you know lots of work. And uh, I, from the time I was two to the time I was 10, I grew up in a certain part of town that was, um, housing that was built, rental housing that was built after the war. And I call this one, um, the fight. If you said you lived in the subdivision or the tree streets, everybody knew where it was. It was the rental housing built by the Canada Oregon Housing Corporation after the war, the veterans. There were two houses. There were little square in boxes covered with aluminum siding that was silver and it got black when it was dirty and hot in the summer and cold in the winter. And one and a half story, two, three bedroom place that had kind of a, brittle beige yellow shingle on it. And at one end of the street, nestled on both sides were little groups of the small houses and the bigger houses were at the other end. We lived at 111 Chestnut Avenue. And to our left was Brent McFarlane and his family. And to our right was Bobby Jerome. And beside him were the Fitzpatrick girl. And across the street from them were Campbell and David Walker. And then my best friend, Susan Lokes, and then Uncle Fred and Aunt Irma, a little bit older couple who used to babysit us. Um, sometimes. That was our tribe, our hood. It was, but we never went anywhere else. We never played at the other end of the street. Not that ever, anything ever happened between that, the kids at that end and us. We just never went there. But we had Dougie Nesbitt. He was a bully. We never asked him to play with us, and most of the time he didn't. But every once in a while, he'd show up and chase us and terrorize us. We hated him, and we feared him. One Saturday morning, we were all down at Fitzpatrick's playing in the new sandbox, the only one in our part of um, on our part of the street. And then Dougie showed up, and then there was crying. The two little girls started to cry. We didn't know if he was throwing sand around or emptying the box out. But Mr. Fitzpatrick came out and chased him home because he lived on the corner house next to Fitzpatrick's. The next thing you know, Mr. Fitzpatrick and Mr. Nesbitt were having a fist fight on Nesbitt's back porch. Well, we just stood there open mouthed, and when it was over, we went home. Real life is a lot more interesting than the movies, and a new sandbox paled in comparison. On the house behind us, there was a woman who used to come out on her back porch sometimes and scream and cry. There was a man down the street that only had one leg. It was said that Leo Ryan used to drink too much. Uh, Dodie Loves was the only woman we knew who had a job outside the home. And my dad worked in the post office, but two or three nights a week, he was a waiter in a bar, and they called him Silver because it was white hair. By the time I was 10, I knew a lot of things about life. I knew about sad things and happy things and tragic things and weird things and meanness and bullies and the black and the white and the gray. I just didn't know it yet. Um, 
That housing was built for veterans who had children. So I literally grew up in the midst of hundreds of kids. Like they were just everywhere. And the smart mothers figured out they needed to do something about this. I call this one almost drowning. When the mothers realized that they'd be having a birthday party every week, they figured they had to change things. So they decided to have one birthday party in the summer for everybody. <laughs> I never had a birthday for anybody outside of my family until I was on my own as an adult. So they'd pick a, a afternoon in the summer, they'd arrange cars, and we'd all go up to Canada or Park, the public park and beach that had grass and picnic tables and barbecue pits and covered areas, and it was right across from the beach. And we'd have hot dogs and cake, and all the two-year-olds would get the same gift, and all the five-year-olds would get the same gift. <laughs> and then some of the mothers would take us over to the, to the water to, to play in the water. I don't know. I was maybe like six or seven. I didn't know how to swim yet. But I could tread water and I could um, do the dog paddle. And so we were playing around and I was kind of moving out a little further than I usually did. I think because there were some older kids there and I wanted to be with them. And all of a sudden I could feel my toes trying to hang on to the sand that was sliding away and my head strung back to keep my mouth and my nose clear. And I yelled to Campbell, one of the older kids, to help me and he wouldn't. So I had to make my own way back. I don't think I ever told anybody about that, but it just became one of my I almost drowned stories in my life. And when I think back on it, I think that's when I actually began to realize that there was no such thing as a knight in shining armor or a savior who was going to rescue me. I was pretty independent by then, already the oldest of three. But I think that's when I began to grow into the self-sufficient person that I became who never needed anybody. Um, this one I call sharp objects and other things to be wary of. We played outside all the time because our houses were too small for gatherings. In the winter time, we skated on backyard rinks. Everybody had a backyard rink and the three or four dads on our side of the street decided to make one big one. So they'd be out there for several nights in the cold December weather with hoses and shovels and hot toddies and they made a big rink. We skated on it all the time. We played hockey, we played chase, we played crack the whip, which I think is really about trying to kill somebody. And we had sword fights with icicles from the eaves. In the summertime, we played on the front yards. Sometimes we took our shoes off when we weren't supposed to. And somebody always stepped on a picker. I don't know what they were called, but they were round and flat and green and hid in the grass, just ready to jump out and snag somebody as they went by. So you'd have to stop and sit down and take the picker out and hobble around. There was no sympathy from anybody and nobody ever said, watch out, there's a picker over there. <laughs> or somebody would step in dog food way before there was any bylaws that were clean enough after your dogs. And when that happened, everybody would hold their nose and point their fingers and laugh and call you stinky while you were trying to rub it all off on a, a dandelion or thick clover. Nobody ever told you not to step there either. We were vicious with each other sometimes, a little bit like Lord of the Flies before it was written. But we were democratic. Everybody had a chance to laugh and be laughed at. One time, a neighbor got a, a bow and arrow for a birthday present. So we were all out back watching him shoot it up in the air and sit around and watch it come down. <laughs> Just missed my brother's eye. We were collectively stupid or just young. There were all kinds of things to be wary of. There were sharp rocks and metal bottle caps and um, lawnmower blades and ringer washers and pickers and thistles and all kinds of things like that. Pointed uh, sticks, sticks thrust through uh, bicycle boat, trying to light fires with magnifying glasses, playing with mercury from broken um, thermometers. You know, I, it's amazing that we survived, but we did. By the time I left there when I was 10, we were all still intact. There was a few broken bones. There were lots of stitches, but we were all okay. And we all grew up to be adults and find out there were just as many things we worry about as adults. There were, there were cold drugs and pointed words and sharp tongues and piercing eyes. And they were still bullies and meanness and cheating spouses and lying friends and broken hearts and falling stars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tammy. I can understand why I like this person. <laughs> Thank you very much. One more round of applause, come on. <laughs> Thank you.
And now to our featured reader, Daniel G. Scott. I've never asked you, Daniel, what does the G stand for? George. I would have guessed. I should have said that. I'm so guessed. Does Daniel need an introduction here? No. no. I will still give you one. <laughs> Daniel George Scott has recently published Travels with a Thoma, and that's what he's going to read to us from entirely, or is there? are you going to read from anything else? Just that. Wonderful. And I just let you know that he has also published several other works, including After Time, Voicing Suicide, an edited anthology of suicide poems, and a book called Clichés, spelled a little differently, <laughs> Clichés Undone, Volume 1. Of course, as you know, he is the past artistic director of Planet Earth Poetry. Many of you, well, I, for my part, knew Planet Earth Poetry as Daniel Scott. He was like the first face I knew here. And I'm very happy that he's here tonight. For some reason, suddenly I'm standing here where he, where he used to stand. But I'm very happy to go away now and give him the stage. Please give a warm welcome, Daniel Scott. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks very much, Thorsten. Uh, your sense of humor has been wonderful tonight. It's really fun to to, uh, to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks to Planet Earth Poetry for surviving. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and because I've been wandering around reading in other places, it's, it's really wonderful to come here and see the crowd and hear such excellent open mics. You have no idea how bad some of them can be. <laughs> It's stunning. <laughs> so what I'm going to read to you from tonight is um, this new book, Travels with Athoma. Uh, the book is a single piece. Uh, I call it, uh, my initial sort of naming of it was it's a fictional memoir in verse. Um, and I'll sort of walk you through bits and pieces of it um, so that there's a bit of a through line for it. For it. I, I also want to say a big thank you to Aeolus House, to Alan Breesmaster, who took this on. And he wasn't the first publisher I tried. Uh, because the book doesn't fit tidily into a genre, it was difficult to find a home for it. So I'm going to start uh, and just read the first page, the program, to kind of set the stage for the book, because I do want to jump over quite a lot of the story to get to some pieces. I try to read different pieces in different places. And this is in the voice of the narrator. My lessons about travel began when I was small, before I really understood. Athoma taught me to travel pathways from here in me to there inside others. My spirit traveled out on her songs, came to know being different feeling, seeing differently, then return. What Athoma taught me remains with me and her too. She is still close. I live with her lessons, her soft voice, her songs, their subtle grace. My time has come to sing the songs, to guide, to teach, to tell what can be told. So in the first couple of sections of the book, um, the boy um, begins to visit Athoma in her home. He begins to um, be curious about things. She's teaching him about herbs and gardening and a number of things. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read you a little bit here of him, uh, around his first travel, which is called Being Tree. One day I asked, what is it like to be a tree? Just stand with your arms out. And I stood like a tree, fluttering my fingers like they were leaves. She looks at me, her head nodding. Yes, yes, it's time. Perhaps it's time. I remember feeling odd, thinking how wise, wise she was, how much she knew, her brown eyes glittering. You could know what is to be tree. I look at her. Now, travel into tree, you inside tree. I send you, you must choose to go. I can do, send you, visit tree from inside. I looked at her, tilted my head, wondered how she would do that. 
Me in a tree? How? Your spirit travel is not hard. I do with song. Just visit tree, the songs you learn me. Travel songs. I sing, you go. I sing, you come back. You sing. I watch, wait. I want to know to be tree. I'll say, I say, yes, I'll go. Into tree. Yes, please. Into tree, you want to go. Yeah, yeah, I do. You're sure. Three yeses is sure. Yeah, uh, yes, for sure. I start to get up to go to the three. No, you stay here in chair by stove. Only spirit travels on my song. You go, I stay with you here, make sure, let you stay a while. Time is not same, don't worry. I bring you back a different song. And so she sends him into a tree. Um, and I, I'll skip over to his second journey into a tree um, and leave you to imagine his first visit in the fir tree. I remember another tree, the cedar in the yard, the one I climbed. A different day I asked because I liked that tree so much. Fish, now you can go. I sing, and she does, and I'm moving across the yard, my body still on the steps by the door. I feel the straightness, the core, a vertical arrow, cedar limbs spiraling in perfect balance. I remember sliding down, laughing. The rich scent of cedar fills me, a kind of elegance I have never tasted. I can say after being there, inside, a cedar tree is soft. Cedar boughs, are, cedar boughs arc to delicate fingers. They do not move on their own. A drop of rain, one frond bobs, a breath of wind, a boughs sways, stirs lived stillness. Cedar lives calm, lives a meditation, holds its place present, the deep rhythm quieter, softer. The fur was younger, prickly, not so quiet, lively, yet still. I have lived in that stillness. So after um, trees, he begins to travel into some uh, other creatures, uh, birds, hummingbird, aphids. Um, no, hummingbirds, ladybugs, he observes aphids, which is quite a funny little passage, anyhow. Another hot and humid day, the air thick in my arms. Athoma sits with me by the pond, the air alive with creatures. Dragonflies, ancient ones. You want to travel? Yes, I say. And she sings. Yes, a new song. I hear the words over and over. After me, you try after me. Only in your ears, only in your heart, only on your lips. You must never, never mark them down, never, on wood, on paper, on stone. We sing and sing until I know the song, and I am there. A crystal clear wing pair buzzes over my back. Flecks of red and blue dot my needle tail. Hover, dart, hover over turtles and ducks on the pond. Chase gnats and mosquitoes among reeds and ferns. The heat of the afternoon the heat of the afternoon and the light from the pond multiplied in my eyes. I'd been studying dinosaurs at school. Think how for eons over earth, water, we have flown. The earth, an ancient dragonfly garden. My elders flew with dinosaurs, mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, with giant beavers and moose. And here I fly over a small pond ringed with reeds two ducks swimming and the air alive with insects, over, dart, over, eyes with a hundred windows of light, the pond, the grass, and fragments all tied together, the mosquitoes so easy to see move across the windows, closer and closer, and then gone, snatched in mid-flight. Then, Athoma sings me home. Enough, it's good, enough for now. Listen, look, up above, a helicopter passes overhead. I look, a bulbous head, long tapering tail, whirling blades at the shoulders, a dragonfly shape 
The ancient form copied for flight. I watched the helicopter. Wish I could ride in one. Dragon flies better, she says. Quiet, delicate. Eats mosquitoes is good. You fly already. Better, better. So, um, let's consult my notes here. Where do we go from here? Oh, so he's, for the most part, um, does as he's told, but there's one incident where he kind of doesn't do quite what he's told. This is kind of fun. There was only one time Athoma was displeased with me. It was starting to warm up and the snow was disappearing. I saw some fresh otter tracks by the river and wanted to otter travel again. Athoma hesitated, saying something under her breath I did not understand. I thought she said, wrong season. I persisted asking again and again. Finally, she looks at me. Okay, you go. Short travel. I call you back, sing return song, you come. We practice the song to come home. You must sing it yourself. When you go, I wait. Sing calling song, you come. Practice songs here, after me, after me. As we always did, we practiced the travel song and the coming home song over and over. I felt like I already knew it, but Athoma knew best. I trusted her even in pushing for auto travel one more time. As I settled into the rocking chair after putting two chunks of wood into the Stanley firebox, she said again, when I call you come, sing the coming home song, say thank you, come. When I call, come. I sang the travel song and could feel my body climbing out of the water, fur wet, feel the undulating motion of back and legs up the river bank, chasing another otter. She turned, launched herself down a mudslide into the river, dodging ice chunks. I followed once, twice, twisting through the water, tail ruddering turns, staying close to her, bumping her tail, her flank with my head but never passing her, staying close. I thought I heard the call song, wasn't sure, felt a different heat in the otter body, loud. I tried not to hear the calling song, closed my ears like I was underwater. The other otter was rolling in the mud, rolling with me. I could smell her heat too. It was all I could smell. Suddenly the call song was very loud, louder than I had ever heard. I was rolling over her, onto her, biting her neck, and I knew I had to sing the coming home song. I did not want to leave. This otter play was not the same. I wanted to know about the smell, the heat, the pulse holding me, but could not stay, the calling song growing, tugging at me. I sang thank you and goodbye. The feel of her neck in my jaw, the excitement rising, the tingle in my belly down low, enticing, intense. And then I was in the rocking chair, panting hot, feeling something new in my own body. Athoma was standing over me, voice raised. You did not answer when I called you home. I say you must. Some things are not yet for you, too soon. You want to travel in earth and rocks. You have to learn always to listen. Not everything is safe or right time to learn. I should not have let you go. Here, drink. She handed me a glass with a cold, bitter tea. And sweet at the same time, the heat in my body went away, left me tired. But I remembered the heat and the otter smell, knew I was growing up, knew I had come close to something adult, something bigger than me. After sitting still for a while, making sure I was back, I apologized, said, I was having fun and did not want to come back. Playing, I said, although I knew it was more than play. She said, easy to get lost. You stay too long, maybe not come back. I worry. You growing up, learning other things. Maybe you not want to come back. Maybe you're not strong enough. Maybe I lose you. Not good. Not good. But you did come is enough for today.
for a time, a longer time, enough. Today, not good. So he's in a little trouble and he doesn't get to uh, travel for quite some time. Um, and then she starts traveling with him again. Um, I'm missing one of my tags. Here we go. I um, one of um, when we were putting the book together, the uh, Julie McNeil, the designer, had just a couple of crows up in the corner, and I said I wanted more crows, partly because there's a lovely long passage in here about traveling with crows, and I think I'm going to read that to you as the last thing. It's a fairly long piece. Um, have I got the right page? Yes, I do. Now, she says, there is new lesson for you. Flying again with trickster bird. Bird with good eyes, good mind. Yes, can think. Not an easy travel. You will need strength. Not to be afraid. Oh, maybe be afraid a little, but go. Travel in crow. Learn how crow sees world, survives. I remember the feel of fear the horses had, a small, always alertness they had to have, and how, when they were safe, the deep calm they carried. You sure? Athoma eyed me, searched me. I was not sure I could manage fear. I did know what it felt like, but feel my nostrils flare like a mare's, my chest tighter, my breathing different. Yes, is good, a little fear. Becomes a respect when you carry it. When you no pretend you are not afraid. Crow is very wise, does not like lies, is good at tricks, so knows how lies work. Remember, I did not decide that day. I walked home slowly, listened to the crows calling through the cedars. One seemed to follow me along the lane, once even landing in the shorter grass and hopping beside me, then flying off, cawing and cackling. For the next few days, everywhere I went, I was aware of crows of being watched, watching in return. There were little groups of them, nimble in the air, yakking at each other or gathering high up in a maple. I noticed how they bobbed with their, with their whole bodies when they spoke or yelled. How many different sounds they made, cawing back and forth, then in a flurry, they would fly off. I dreamt crows for two nights, them calling, be silent. At first, but on the second night, just before I woke up, I called back and said, yes. I got up, had breakfast, and told my mother I was going to spend the day with a Thoma. As I walked down the lane, one crow came overhead, following me, maybe the same one as before, as if it was waiting. I came to the crest of the hill and saw the house. I came to the crest of the hill, and as the house came into view, the red door opened and Athoma stepped out. She was smiling. You come, you come, it's good. You ready, crows too, waiting for you. You learn their travel song, beautiful song, lyrics not easy. After me, after me. And we sing together until I had the sounds in my ears, on my lips, in my heart. I sat in the rocker and sang, my eyes closed. I felt myself travel, opened my eyes, and I was in a birch tree high up, looking out over a ridge, trees, and tumbled rocks. I could hear a call to come, and another, and then we were in the air, swooping. We flew towards the other voices, calling back. I could hear a language, almost, and after a while it seemed to make sense. Only a few words in the sounds, pitches and halts, the rumbles and rasps. The crows were talking. I don't know what else to call it. They could tell things to one another. For the first time in my travels into trees, insects, otters, birds, I realized the crow knew it had a visitor. The crow was aware of me. It knew me. Had a memory of my face. Knew a thoma. Other faces knew where we were. There were lots of crows all flying in the same direction, yelling and laughing. We settled into a big oak tree, chattering and cackling. I could feel laughter and celebration, but not singing. It was noisy and rough, raucous. 
It went on for a long time and then quiet as night came and darkness. I could see the shapes of the other crows on the branches and then sleep. The crow was sleeping. I don't know if I did. I worried about time and remembered Athoma telling me travel time was not the same as day to day time. Waited. Then it was early morning and the crows were flying off in all directions. We flew too towards the river and it was as if I was being asked, what did I think? Was it fun? The crow dove and dodged in a play fight with another bird, showing off, I thought, and got a sneer in response. Play, fun, all the words one syllable, basic. We followed the river into the village, past the bridge, and turned up the street where we lived. My mother was in the yard. The crow dove, I thought, no. The crow laughed, wheeled up and banked to land about 10 feet from my mother. She looked at the crow, reached into her pocket and tossed part of a biscuit. The crow cackled like a thank you, wolfed the biscuit down and hopped a little closer. Go on, no more today, my mother said. The crow jumped, unfurled wings, and we were in the air up on the cedar beside the house. I could look into my room see my stuff. The crow knew, had seen me there before, came to see my mother get a chunk of biscuit or bread. I did not want to leave. Back in the air, we crossed the village, stopped at a spilled garbage can and started yelling, food, food, and crows called back, gathered for a small feast of fruit skins, chunks of meat and a sauce, lettuce, all smeared together, all devoured with a few tussles like a tug of war. One older, bigger crow got the best pieces but everybody got some. More flights around the village. The crow knew the territory, knew where things were, where there might be food or play, and always the chattering and cawing. The strength of the laughter and sense of pleasure amazed me. A party atmosphere every day, and how they talked, and I think schemed, tried things. I can't explain. At one point, the crow spotted a nest with eggs, and suddenly there was an aerial battle with three sparrows diving at us, forcing us away from the nest. There was a lot of twisting and turning with tiny claws grabbing, aimed mostly at our head. Not worth it, the crow seemed to say, and we flew away, settled onto a roof peak as the sun got hot on our back. The crow sat a while, groomed under both wings, and then jumped into the air, and flew back along the river to land on the roof of Athoma's house. The red door opened. She came out into the yard. I saw her looking up. I was being delivered back, and so I sang the coming home song and the thank you song over and over as I returned to my body in the rocking chair. Athoma came back in. Ah, oh, you back. Smart, that one. Brings you home, yes? We talked. I described my time and listened as she laughed at my amazement, nodding. Yes, yes, good. You learn the, bird, the bird, this bird is thinking, watching, not dumb animal. No animals dumb or birds. They watch us, know us, what we do. That day, through all of me, I knew how alive the world was and how I was in the world with all the others. I had felt them, traveled them, in them, with them. I don't have all the words to say what I sensed. The immensity, something I knew but could not reach, a silence around it, I couldn't say. Thank you.